going to read uh, the passage of scripture for today. We will be in Acts chapter 9. And I do want to remind you all that y'all just got done telling the Lord yes. And so by the end of this message, I hope there's a complete yes. Acts chapter 9. We're going to read most of the chapter. I'm going to skip a few verses that are not as important to this message. 50 minutes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. I'm just going to start reading. There it goes. Uh, NASB version. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he asked for letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if, he, that if he found any belonging to the way, whether men or women, he might bring them in shackles to Jerusalem. Now as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Okay. Let's skip down to verse 10. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. And he, is, and he has seen in a vision a man, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer in behalf of my name. I'm going to preach today from a title, uh, a sermon title, Hit the Road. So, thank you, Father, for this preaching moment. Um, your sons and daughters have gathered today to hear a word from you. Lord, allow me to convey this message the way you gave it to me. Let someone's life be changed. Let someone's mind be renewed. Let someone's confidence in you increase even the more. And I ask that the word will heal, that it will deliver, set free, and encourage your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. But on your way down, tell someone it's time to hit the road. Okay, pack your bags. We can go home now. Go home now. All right, I'm kidding. So to begin this message, I want to start by highlighting a scenario that we are all familiar with. In this life, we often get busy, um, sometimes too busy to cook a fresh home-cooked meal. It is in those moments where we must rely on previously cooked meals from the night before or a prepackaged meal uh, from the grocery store. Relying on these previously cooked meals often requires the use of an invention called the microwave. Now, for those of you who might be too bougie to use a microwave, just hold on a few moments while I talk to some ordinary people. We're just ordinary people. Uh, come here, John Legend. Uh, so back to the story. If it is a prepackaged meal, there are often instructions on how the item needs to be cooked in a microwave. But if it's a home-cooked meal, sometimes you just got to figure it out on your own. So let's say I'm eating a bowl full of chicken Alfredo fettuccine pasta. I put it in for about two minutes, and then I take it out. I feel that the bowl is hot. The noodles on the top and the sides are hot. But somehow, some way, the noodles and the chicken in the middle are still cold. As cold as when I first put it in. Tell me how. So now I have a decision to make. I can eat the noodles that are hot, leave the rest and throw it out, and just be content. How does that sound to you? It's a waste of food, I know. Or I can stir it up put it back in the microwave and allow it to be fully satisfied knowing that I have ate, I was, I'm able to eat all, everything that I put in the bowl that I purposed for. Me personally, I'm going to put it back in the microwave because I ain't wasting no food. How many of y'all would want to waste food? All right, remember you said no. 
Now let's talk about Saul. We'll talk about the microwave again later. So in Acts 9, we read about a man named Saul. He's from Tarsus. This was a major city at that time known for the production of things. Um, as you know from recent messages, Saul was also a Pharisee. He was a son of a Pharisee. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was full of education and was an astute scholar. So in Acts 9, we see that Saul has made an intentional decision to oppose those of the way. If you've been here the past, the past few months, you also know that the way was what Christians were first referred to as at the beginning of the institution named or known as the church. Up until this point, although Saul has all of his learning and knowledge, his current purpose, as he believes it, was to arrest the fulfillment of purpose from those of the way and prevent them from continuing to spread the word. Now, Saul and his father, as I said, are learned men. They were Pharisees. So that means they actually did believe in the resurrection. So here he is opposing the resurrection itself, which is Jesus Christ through his actions. As he was on his way to persecute those of the way, he hit the road. It was the Damascus, the Damascus road. It interrupted his journey, and he quite literally hit the road. As he hit the road, he had an encounter through a vision with God. I can imagine what he may have been thinking. Has all that what I've done, what I've learned and executed, executed led me to this moment? Will I have to suffer for the things that I've done? Is this God showing me truly that he is real? Have I tried to suppress this truth by trying to run from it? It is at this moment that where his transformation awaited manifestation. So what happened for his manifestation to be confirmed? That leads us to a man named Ananias. He might know what had to happen. So Ananias was a well-standing man. He also saw in a vision from God what he was supposed to speak to Saul. But he was hesitant because of what he heard of Saul. I can imagine what he was thinking. Lord, I know you to be true, but you can't be serious right now. You basically want me to willingly stand in front of, the, of Saul's target practice? You want me to go 100 miles per hour on I-10 to get the deeper nights when I literally see the Texas State Trooper right there. What kind of God would allow me to be in the presence of someone with the kind of story and track record? The name Ananias means God's answer or answered by the Lord. So we can essentially consider this God's word. But here we see tension between God's answer and Saul's story. It was a Lord I believe, but help my unbelief kind, kind of moment. However, I need the comma. Eventually, Ananias too had to hit the road and be the answer to, to Saul's transformation. Without Ananias hitting the road, Saul is chaotic and confused, but he's still guided until. Saul's situation brought him to be exactly where he needed to be in order to receive the answer the word of God concerning, concerning his story. So they both hit the road in Damascus. But what is this place called Damascus? Damascus was an important cultural and commercial center. It is said to be one of the oldest cities. It was a very busy place. You can think of it as a New York City or Las Vegas. Always something to do, so much happening, something always trying to get your attention. Scholars argue that because of its extreme busyness, it became known as a place full of distractions, and it became known as a place known for tasks and assignments not being fulfilled. Now let's get to the point. We're back to Saul. So as we examine the beginning of chapter 9, we can highlight a few things. Saul set out to complete a task. He went through Damascus, the place of incomplete tasks and distractions. It is at this place that Saul has to abort his original task of arresting those of the way. The task was not complete. However, there was a new task awaiting him, but he could not complete that task until the answer, Ananias, showed up to move him beyond where he was. Hit the road means to leave a place or begin a journey. So in this moment, we see that Saul left an old assignment and was ab about to embark on a new one. Yeah. So what does this mean for us? We often read this story and think of it as Saul's life being converted to do ministry, and we equate it to life's transition and salvation. 
this is true. But could it be, could it be? that Saul, his story, could also represent your story in your past? Yeah. What happens when your story is in need of conversion too? <laughs> and I'm not talking about the story that you just thought of. My argument today is that Saul represents the part of your story that you have refused to let God touch and transform. The part of your story that you have buried, the trauma, the letdowns, and the one killing your ability to fully walk in the totality of your true purpose. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you may be doing well, but there's a part of you that has not been converted. You smile, you serve, and you stay in touch. But much like the middle of the bowl of that chicken fettuccine in the microwave, there is a part of you that is still cold and not able to be used. It is that part of you that has hindered you from being able to fully embrace all of who you should be in God. Saul and Ananias both hit the road. You can sit back down and convene at the house of a man named Judas. Now, we know Judas from one way, but his name in Hebrew actually comes from Jehuda, which means God be praised. So in the house of praise, that's where Saul was. A decision and conversion had to be made. We're in the house of praise right now. And Saul had to yield to Ananias touching him and confirm the purpose he had over his life. Like I said, like the exchange, we are in the house of praise and we think we're doing okay, but there's still the cold part of us that the answer has to touch. And he, got, he has to touch all of it. So what do you do? When your story has you on a journey full of distractions, but you take great pride in being partially content under the guise that no one will understand or fully accept your whole story. You'll resolve that the stain in your story can't be used by God. You have sat in the shame of your story and you felt your story could not be used. You felt it was too much to be of any good. You even understand the message of grace but you keep thinking about the harmful power of Saul before Ananias is touched. So let's talk about the thoughts and perceptions of what you heard. In Acts 9 and 13, we see the impact of internalized perception when Ananias responds, but I heard what Saul has done. What have you heard about people who may have stories like yours? You may say you come from nothing. You may used to wild and out and this seems to be the only thing that people will ever remember you for. You seemingly make mistakes, or you made mistakes that have produced other people, such as children, and you are constantly reminded of this at each birthday. You entered a relationship that ended up in a divorce. Now you wonder what advice you can offer to others when you couldn't even get it right yourself, even though it's been years and years long ago. You wrestle with how the word can fully reconcile your full story. Yes, you believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. Yes, well, today I am talking to a group of people who are going to decide to let their story and the answer hit the road. Yeah. Yeah. You want to transform into the fullness of who God has made them to be. Living beneath your fullness can kill your purpose, and it's an insult to God. But there is an answer. Yeah. Ananias serves as the answer and confirmation. Ananias had to get beyond the fear, and he had to get beyond what he heard. The unhealed and unaddressed Saul you fight with daily is ready to be converted. Hit the road. Acts 26 and 18. Paul, Paul preached to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who have been sanctified in faith. Saul was able to realize that there can be a power shift from darkness to light, from Satan to God. Many of you have given a fuel to the wrong kind of power over your story, but you can stop the cycle today if you decide to hit the road. If you'll just take a moment to be honest with yourself and examine the parts you have safeguarded. What have you said I'll deal with later? Why not deal with it now? Why be tormented any further? Even in this moment, some of you are saying, no, nah, that's not even me. That's not me. That's all. Hit the road. The answer, hit the road with this message. Now it's time for you to meet the answer. 
Acknowledge what Saul did to you, your past decisions, your experiences, the hurt, and the things unresolved. Acknowledge what makes you fear addressing this. Why does this hurt? And why is it making you fearful to operate fully in your purpose? Now imagine yourself free. Imagine taking the power back over your story. Imagine your story being used to the glory of God. Imagine the freedom and purpose you'll have by snatching the painful sting out of your story and watching the power of God overtake it. It's time to answer to touch. It's time for the answer to touch your story and for you to be made whole, walking fully and boldly in what God has for you. Many of you are wrestling with the answer. The answer, the answer had to come through the place of praise. It had to be in tune with what God said. It had to obey even when scared. It had to trust God more than the fear. It had to trust God more than the pain. The answer had to be the key to shift Saul from a sinner to a saint. The story had power over you, but today you must decide to give it a new power. Saul received the Holy Spirit. Come here, Acts 2.38. After the Holy Ghost comes, you shall receive power. The power makes you do. The power makes you move boldly in God, in your God-given purpose. Hit the road and shift the power. So I'm actually near my clothes. <laughs> I want to give an opportunity for someone who said this message was for me. I've been holding on to some things and I have not allowed God to touch it. You're saying, yes, there are some unresolved parts of my story that I have hid. There are parts to my story that I have not allowed God to deal with. I have been hesitant to move fully into purpose because I made myself believe that God couldn't use that aspect of my story. I let guilt and shame overtake me. I became content with giving a partial yes. There's a room full of potential here. And how many of you can admit there's parts of your story that you have not allowed God to touch? You're sitting on gifts, you're sitting on your business ideas, you're sitting on ministry, and you have refused to let God to touch it. Let God touch it today as you hit the road. There was a woman at the well in John chapter 4. She set out for a purpose. Now what that purpose was, my God. But she met a man named Jesus. They weren't supposed to even be talking. Who she was her past and what was embedded within her made her believe that she was unworthy. But regardless, Jesus already knew all about her and he answered her past and confirmed her future. The past was addressed and then the purpose was able to be fulfilled. Now Saul, he knew he was on a journey that did not lead to his true purpose. But along that journey, there came an answer. The answer was Jesus Christ. And he's coming to speak to that hurt and pain and transform you fully into what he has for you. And then like the woman at the well and like Saul, the transformation of your story can also take place through Jesus Christ. His power to push you into fulfilled purpose. When you only give God a partial yes, you lock up your, your purpose and the potential in others. Saul was full of potential, but he needed the prayer of agreement, confirmation, and belief of Ananias to transform and walk fully into his purpose. When you decide to hit the road, nothing else matters other than the fact that God has spoken to your story and provided the answer to your future. So make the decision to hit the road today. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it left you traumatized, but God can use that too. Don't live beneath your purpose. Yes to that call over your life. He didn't call for perfection. Yes to that idea. Yes, you do have something to say. Yes to serving in that ministry on that team. Yes to building that legacy for your family. And just be reminded that it won't end like the last time. 
in Acts chapter 9, verse 19 through 22. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name? and had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding Jews who lived in Damascus by, by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Know when you make this decision to allow God to touch your whole story, there may be some that still keep you bound in your last place. It won't be easy, but it's necessary. It's necessary for your future, for your purpose. If that's you, I do want to open up this moment for an altar call. We want to pray with you, and we want to see the full trans transformation of your story to testify of the power of Jesus Christ. Now, throughout this message, there have been many of you who a story came to mind of something that you intentionally refused to allow God to touch. You say, no, I'll deal with that later. No, that's not for me right now. I'm comfortable where I am. But how many of you know that you're killing your future? Not moving fully into your purpose is an insult to God. You wrestle with this daily, you think about it daily, but you have not allowed God to touch it. God is here and he can touch that thing today. I will call our ministers forward. God wants to use your full story. You have made up in your mind that it's not even worth it. You have made up in your mind that I'll live the rest of my life with this. But God wants you to know that you can be totally healed and you can walk boldly into your full purpose. Even some of you right now are still thinking, I don't want God to touch that. But I'm telling you that it's necessary that God has to touch it. It's no longer just about you, but it's about the God that's in you. It's about your future. It's about living fully and boldly into what God will have for you. You have come into agreement with this thing and you will begin to identify it as who you are. It's not who you are. It is a part of your story, but it can be used for God's purpose.